Hey everyone, this is Damon with Wild World Rescue and Sanctuary. Uh, we're a not-for-profit wildlife rescue. We rescue hundreds of injured animals each year. Uh, the goal is to uh, rescue animals that are injured or ill um, or, um, you know, other issues going on, things, you know, litter stuck on them, stuff like that, get them treatment, return them to the wild. I also rescue exotic animals, so people drop off uh, exotic pets that they can't care for anymore. We uh, sometimes find them in the wild here in Florida, and I either keep them or find them homes uh, since they can't be returned to the wild. Uh, now, we are a not-for-profit rescue. Uh, we survive on donations. I am not paid. I'm a volunteer of my own organization. Uh, we just don't make enough money for me to be paid at this point, um, hopefully down the road, you know, but right now it's about animals and, you know, building, you know, the business so uh, that maybe someday after we're all the animals are taken care of, I can actually afford to pay myself some. Um, but uh, the big thing is I just want to save animals and, you um, I've been doing it for 18 years, but I started my own not-for-profit about two years ago. Uh, recently, I've been thinking about making videos uh, about wildlife rescue because there's not really a school for wildlife rescue. There are some wildlife rehabilitation organizations and rescues that will do some training for you when you start a job, but they don't really uh, have a school for it um, or a standard training. And I thought making making some of these videos uh, to pass on some of my knowledge might be helpful for those that are thinking about getting into this line of work. Uh, first of all, I'll say you don't make a whole lot of money in wildlife rescue. If you're looking to make money, it's not the right place to go. Um, it's basically a career of passion. Uh, you got to love what you do and hopefully have some sort of other financial support um, through a, um, you know, a spouse or, you know, wherever, because you're just, most cases, not going to be able to cut it unless you're just one of these really successful organizations, which I hope to be at some point, but not at this point. So, um, so I want to make these videos to pass down the knowledge, uh, teach people about wildlife rescue and some of the things I've learned over the 18 years that I've been doing it. Uh, most of my knowledge comes specifically from rescuing animals that are native to Florida, since that's where I've been my 18 years of rescuing wildlife. So uh, some of the stuff uh, wouldn't apply to animals in other regions of the U.S. or uh, North America or around the world because there's different animals and uh, you know so I'm gonna get into specifics about uh, types of birds and mammals and things like that reptiles that I work with how I capture them uh, how to handle them that type of stuff this first video I'm gonna focus on sandhill cranes uh, the reason I'm focusing on uh, capturing and rescuing sandhill cranes is because they're one of the most common calls I get, and I also have some unique tools to um, capture them, so I tend to get called more often for that. People in the area figure out that you have those tools. They tend to rely on you a little bit more uh, to rescue them. So we'll start with sandhill cranes. Um, so first of all, um, sandhill cranes get injured a lot because they have tall, uh, long legs. They're a tall bird, about four feet tall gray, have a red cap on their head. Um, they're very common in Florida. You see them a lot on golf courses, open fields, marshes, things like that. Sandhill cranes are a fairly harmless bird, even though they're pretty big. Um, you know, and sometimes they put on a dramatic show. If you get too close to them or their babies, they'll put their wings out and they look scarier than they are sometimes, uh, if you approach them and they're up, upset, excuse me. Um, but, um, they're really, um, uh, a very docile, easy bird to deal with, um, but they are powerful. So when handling them, um, it can be a little bit difficult sometimes. Now, I get called to call, uh, catch sandhill cranes a lot because because of their long legs, their long legs uh, get injured easily. They're long and thin, uh, kind of fragile for how big of a bird they are. So they get hit by golf balls, broken, hit by cars. Um, you know, uh, various ways that they can get injured. They also like to root in the ground with their beaks to get grubs and other insects. And in the process, they tend to, um, like, they get into that weed cloth around uh, the edges of homes and they get it stuck on their beak and other trash gets stuck on their beak and they can't open their mouth and they'll slowly die like that. So my calls are often to catch them because they have an injured leg or because they have something stuck on their beak. Those are the two most common reasons. If they have a broken wing, you know, it's pretty simple. I mean, they can run kind of fast, but you can usually chase them and if you're in decent shape with a net and catch them. If they have a broken wing, they're not going to be able to fly away. So this is basically for people who are rescuing a sandhill crane that has uh, 
their wings intact and they can still fly well, but have other injuries. So that's where it becomes a little more difficult because obviously we can't fly, so we're not gonna be able to catch them if they fly away. So I have four ways of catching sandhill cranes. I'll start with the easiest and get to the more difficult or more serious ways, whatever you wanna look at it. Uh, the first way of catching a sandhill crane that's injured, first of all, you should always assess whether it even needs to be captured. Some of these leg injuries, they're mild. They'll probably heal on their own. You don't wanna stress the bird out and accidentally kill it in captivity or something when you're treating it. Um, so you have to weigh uh, the risk of catching it um, versus its injury and whether it will just heal on its own in the wild. Not every animal that you get called for actually needs to be caught and brought in. Some uh, will be perfectly fine and maybe, maybe they'll have a limp or something, but you know, they're tough. They survive out there. Now, if you have a severe injury, uh, bones sticking out, stuff like that. And um, you also have to remember that there are rules about amputations on birds like that. So uh, from the uh, federal uh, government for um, US Fish and Wildlife Service, if you rescue a bird that a uh, sandhill crane and it's missing its whole leg, it's pretty much gonna have to be euthanized, unfortunately, because there are rules about that because it's really not a life for that bird in captivity with an entire leg missing because of their long legs. It's difficult for them to get around and prosthetics not very good. Um, and you know, there's so many, only so many birds you can, you know, keep in captivity and you get so many calls on them, it would be difficult. So anyways, uh, assess whether it actually needs to be captured or not. You catch it, uh, first step, uh, after you've assessed that uh, it, it needs to be captured. Um, I would try one, if it can be fed, hand fed, you know, a lot of people will feed these birds, even though I'm not entirely for feeding wildlife. Um, if they're feeding them the right diet birds, I'm not really that concerned about. When you get to alligators, other dangerous animals, that's much worse. You never want to feed them. They're a threat, you know, after you do that. But when it comes to a bird, not as big of a deal. You just want to make sure people are feeding it the right thing. Uh, bread is absolutely not good for birds at all. It's bad for them. So you never want people to feed them bird, uh, bread. Um, but uh, things like, um, you know, uh, fish, uh, lettuce, um, you know, uh, maybe soaked dog food, um, you know, cracked corn, um, you know, mealworms. Uh, you know, there's a lot of different things that you could potentially, you know, feed sandhill cranes here and there. They eat, they're omnivorous, so they eat plants and animals. Um, that would be healthier for them. But that being said, I actually use bread as a bait because unfortunately people feed birds bread so often it triggers a pretty good food response from them when I'm trying to capture them. So you're gonna wanna use uh, bread uh, sometimes, uh, but you can also use fish as a bait uh, for sandhill cranes, cracked corn, stuff like that. Um, but bread often works really well, unfortunately, even though it's bad for them, it's a great bait, so I use it. So step one is to try to catch a sandhill crane. Uh, there's, like I said earlier, there's about four different ways that you can try. Um, if the bird is used to humans, it's been fed by people, it might be more likely to walk right up to you. It doesn't happen all the time, but every once in a while I get a sandhill crane that's so used to people because they've been feeding it that it'll walk right up to me. So if I can put some food on the ground in front of me or even out of my hand if they come up and eat out of it, I can quickly grab them. And I've done that quite a few times. Um, when you grab them, often the first thing that, that's closest to you is their neck because it's a long neck, they're reaching down to grab food. So you can grab them by the neck, but you gotta be uh, very careful because they are a big bird, but they're also very delicate. Um, and they have a lot of power in their legs. So once you grab them by the neck, they're gonna freak out and start jumping around. So as quickly as possible, first of all, don't grab their neck too tight, just enough to make a ring around with your fingers, um, but don't actually tighten around their neck um, just to hold it in place. And then quickly move in to put your hand directly on their back between their wings and push them down to the ground. Not really fast, but you know, as nicely as possible, push them down to the ground. They're powerful, but you can do it. And you push them down to the ground so their legs fold up in their natural position when they lay down. And then you wanna get control of the wings. All this while you're still holding on to the uh, neck. Um, so you push them down to the ground and you try to get their uh, get down on the ground with them and get their wings under their body, under your arm, uh, between your chest and your arm, get your the wings there and then slide your arm under and grab both legs with your hand. 
and keep the bird completely under your arm with the wings uh, under your arm and then grab the two legs and hold them close to their body and again remember all this they're big birds but they're also kind of delicate uh, you don't want to put too much pressure on them you want to allow them to still breathe uh, and uh, then once you have a hold of their legs pick them up off the ground they might fight a little bit and they have strong legs but typically you can hold them um, so you're going to want to get them into a dog uh, carrier as quickly as possible that's usually how i transport them uh, make sure you have a, a like a smooth plastic dog carrier is best you don't want to use these metal wire cages uh, where their feathers or broken bones or wings can get stuck in all these openings in the metal um, and hurt them even further you want to have a smooth plastic dog carrier uh, with minimal openings not a whole lot of openings on it um, and put a thick towel in there so they have something to sit on and feel comfortable like the grass you know that they normally sit in and uh, once you put them inside and they're on top of this nice soft towel close the door um, and cover it with a sheet or a towel the whole carrier because you want them to be kind of dark it calms them down uh, if they're in the dark and you want to keep things as quiet as possible and you don't want to blast the AC so it's ice cold you want to keep them kind of warm um, you know this is all things that will help, the, help them as they're extremely stressed out after you've captured them and they're injured uh, so that's the first way of trying to catch them is by hand um, with some food uh, baiting them in that doesn't always work most of the time it doesn't work so next step to try and this is a one that even the homeowners themselves are the people that call with a uh, injured animal injured sandhill crane might be able to try themselves and this is trapping them in a screened in lanai pool cage or a garage uh, so what you do is if they're used to being fed by humans or you know taking food from a um, you know some sort of feeding uh, tray or something like that you can put a dish of food or put some food right at the uh, door to your lanai or pool cage or your garage door and then you don't want to put it all the way inside because they do understand sometimes that it could potentially be a trap they don't feel comfortable going in all the way but if you put it right at the door a lot of times they'll walk up to the door and they'll start eating so with while they're doing that you can go inside the house and go through the front door or wherever and come out behind them and then you try to sneak up and scare them so they go forward inside of the pool cage lanai or garage and so then they're trapped inside of this area and you close the door behind them uh, that's one way to catch them uh, and it works quite often I see a lot of people do it I've done it many times myself so that can work um, especially if they're very trusting of the humans that they're getting food from uh, so once they're trapped inside of there um, you know you can you can uh, you know obviously if you're a rescuer you can put them in the carrier and take them to the hospital or uh, you know tell the people to wait until you get there and you can catch them up and uh, put them in so that's uh, number the number two way that you might want to try and catch a sandhill crane we uh, we just discussed uh, two different ways to catch a sandhill crane that's injured the third way is uh, to use a noose with a fishing pole so I have a fishing pole and it has a regular fishing line on it but at the end I tie a long string string just works better for the noose um, so you tie a long string maybe 10 to 15 foot long string to the end of your fishing line and then at the very end of that string you're gonna get a little uh, metal ring which you can find at the hardware stores um, you get a little metal ring and tie a knot around that metal ring at the very end of this string and then you take some of that string and loop it through the ring this creates a noose and you can lay that noose down on the ground in a big circle down on the ground um, big enough for a sandhill crane to comfortably step inside of so you put a little bait like I said bread fish whatever in the center of this uh, noose that you've laid down on the ground and then you give the uh, fishing line some strack slack the pole and you back up a ways get behind a bush or a tree or whatever or just far enough away where the sandhill crane feels comfortable walking up because some of them are really skittish and they don't want to get close to you but if you leave some food on the ground a lot of times they'll walk right up after you walk away and so you have this noose trap set you know you get your fishing pole ready now when it steps into that uh, noose first of all it's best if both legs get in but if only one leg goes in sometimes they don't step in all the way you get one leg that's what you got to work with what you want to do is you want to tighten the line a little bit and you want to pull 
up really high as you're pulling up and, and reeling in at the same time, but you don't want to do it hard enough that you're going to hurt their leg. You don't want to like really pull on their leg hard and injure them. They're going to start fighting as soon as that noose tightens around their leg or legs. Um, so you just want to keep enough pressure on there that the noose stays tight. Uh, you walk towards them as you reel in. Don't pull them to you because, again, that could injure them more. So you keep them tight on the line and just keep reeling as you walk towards them quickly, uh, reeling fast. And then once you get to them, keep, you know, obviously some pressure on that line and use a hand to try and put on their back and push them down to the ground and get control of the bird. And obviously from there, you know, get the bird under control and remove the uh, noose from their legs. Um, so that's worked really well for me. I've done it many times using a noose to, I have videos um, uh, that I've done with GoPros, wearing GoPros while I've done that. And uh, it's worked quite effectively. It doesn't always work though. And you get some birds that just don't wanna be caught. They don't want anything to do with you, but they're gonna die if you don't catch them. So that comes to the third, or sorry, fourth uh, way of capturing a sandhill crane. All right, so uh, we just discussed the first uh, three ways of potentially capturing a sandhill crane. The fourth way, not everybody will be able to do, unfortunately, because um, it requires a special tool, uh, which is a net launching device. Uh, so um, I have both the common ones used. Uh, there's the uh, smaller, what looks like a, almost like a flashlight, that uses a um, CO2 cartridge to shoot out a net. Um, this one is significantly cheaper um, and it's much more frustrating to use and it's not really that effective on larger birds. Um, so the CO2 powered smaller ones that look kind of like flashlights, um, uh, they um, have a very uh, lightweight net and the net, it gets tangled so badly that it can take an hour to untangle and, and repacking it itself is a whole process. The CO2 cartridges it uses are a special cartridge that costs $5 each. So every time you pull the trigger, it's $5. Uh, so practicing becomes expensive. If you shoot a bigger bird like a sandhill crane or a great blue heron with this net launching device, uh, the net is too lightweight and it will tangle on them, but they often can fly away with it. And I had one that was terrifying once when I was first starting to use these, trying them out on those birds. I shot one and it got the sandhill crane, but the sandhill crane started to fly away and it fell off of its back. It wrapped around its legs. So it was flying away with this thing wrapped around its legs. And I was terrified that it was gonna go fly off and get tangled in a bush or a tree and end up dying that way. Um, luckily, as it was flying up in the air, the net fell. It slipped off the feet finally um, and fell to the ground and I was able to recover it. Um, but I'm not a big fan of those types of net launching devices. Uh, they're expensive, they tangle a lot, they're very frustrating to repack. Um, you know, they're, they're not always gonna fire 100% accurately or the uh, net doesn't come out the way you want it to. Um, so. Overall, not a fan of them, but they can be useful for smaller birds, uh, something like a small duck or something like that. They also don't have any flotation device on them, so if they go on the water, they're probably gonna sink, um, and uh, that's, that's gonna be a problem if you're trying to shoot any birds in the water with it to rescue them. Uh, so that brings me to the one that I use most frequently, and it's Coda Net Gun. Uh, they're made in, I believe, Mesa, Arizona. They're more expensive though. So the other ones I just talked about, the CO2 powered smaller net guns or net launching devices, they um, they cost, I've seen them like around a thousand bucks or so, maybe cheaper now since I last look, I don't know. Um, so they are on the cheaper side compared to the Coda net gun. Um, the Coda net gun, uh, it can uh, be around $4,000 to purchase it. It uses blank rifle rounds which is, which is what gives it its explosion to, um, and then it shoots 
you know that pressure comes out of the four tubes that have weights on them and they shoot out and then the net is attached to those weights and follows with it um, you can have uh, weights that have flotation foam on them so you can use them for the water or you can order um, regular weights that don't have flotation on them so devices on them so they can just be used on land so this gun is quite a bit more powerful it's loud it's heavy um, but you get more distance with it. Uh, to me, it's more accurate and the net doesn't tangle as bad. It also tends to hold down larger birds way better. Um, but because of how powerful it is, I only use it if I'm absolutely positive that if I don't catch this sandhill crane or great blue heron, whatever, that that bird's gonna die if I don't use it. And the reason for that is because I'm afraid of injuring the bird using the net launching gun or um, net launching device. Um, it's powerful. So you, first of all, you gotta practice. Find your maximum distance that you're comfortable hitting a target with because that's what you're gonna wanna use. You don't wanna get right up close because if that net fires out at full force, some of those weights are so heavy and they're flying at high speed. If you were to hit the bird with that, it could kill them or injure them severely. And the net itself, if you're too close, grabbing them and flipping the bird could break their legs or wings. Um, so you don't wanna injure this bird more than it already is. You're trying to rescue it. So you wanna find your maximum distance that you can effectively hit your target uh, with the net launching uh, rifle and you can hit them from a pretty good distance when you start practicing with it the wind makes a huge difference obviously a big net firing out um, if it catches the wind uh, you're gonna have a bad day on a windy day if you're out trying to catch these birds but I've shot some pretty long distance and been able to capture them I have videos of that as well uh, which I'll try to post some at some point um, but um, uh, that is the the best tool for a last resort for me i've used it i've caught hundreds of sandhill cranes great blue herons and uh, ducks using the net launching rifle i've also caught uh anhingas and cormorants with it in the water um so um it can be a little more dangerous than using a smaller net launching device or the other methods of rescue, but sometimes you have to use it. You have no other option. This bird just won't even let you get close to it. It flies away. Um, so, um, so a few pointers with it are, as I said before, try to keep as far a distance that you can get while shooting uh, comfortably hitting that target because you don't want to hurt it. Um, if you can get the higher ground, that's always better. Um, you know, shooting them from above, that net's going to come down on top of them and cover them as opposed to hitting them from the side. Uh, that's, you know, uh, I've had a few problems with that. So you always want to aim a little higher than you think because the weights, you know, you got an eight foot by eight foot net. It fires out of this thing and almost immediately is eight foot by eight foot. So then you got these weights that are get down close to the ground quick. And if those weights hit the ground before it gets to the bird, they're going to bounce and throw the net all out of whack it's going to be flying all over the place and you might get lucky and still catch the bird but a lot of times it flips right over it or it just falls to the ground and not effective but so you always want to usually aim a little higher than you think because you want to make sure those weights stay off the ground you're also aiming for the bird's body and not the legs the legs are you know don't really matter you want to aim your main target is the actual body of the bird which is up higher so you want to aim for that now if you can get the upper ground a lot of times what i do is i here in florida we have a lot of retention ponds and little um marshy areas and they uh they stand down in those so i come up on the banks and i get above them and shoot down on them and that's pretty pretty effective uh way of cat catching them uh, you want to be careful about uh, shooting in the water. So just remember, you shoot that net. That net costs about, I don't know, it's like $100 or $150. So you don't want to lose it. And uh, so if you have the one with the flotation devices and you fire it into the water, just remember you got to retrieve it. Um, so maybe you can come up with a way of hooking it and bringing it in. Um, but uh, a lot of times you have to dive out and you know grab it and i actually got tangled in the net once in a deep retention pond after i was trying to retrieve it i failed to catch the bird i was shooting at swam out to get it i was wearing boots and full you know clothing all that and i got tangled in the net and fell underwater and i was struggling and i thought it was going to die it freaked me out quite a bit but i was able to get untangled and get out of it and get back to shore um, but just keep that in mind that you have to recover it when you shoot it out there. So, um, you know, maybe you can, like I said, get a little 
hook and uh, line and throw it out there quick and grab it. I just usually dive in and go after it. So, um, you know, you, you can use it on the water. I've caught many ducks with it. It works quite well. Some of these birds will dive down and under to get out of it. Um, so you have to, you know, get them as fast as possible. When you shoot them with the net, dump, jump in immediately and try and grab them and pull them in. Of course, you know, they can also drown if they get tangled in that net. So, you know, make sure that it's, you know, not too far out or something that you can get really quick and get out of the water because you don't want to drown the bird on accident. So I try not to shoot too many animals in the actual water, maybe right at the edge of the water because it's quick and easy to get them out of there. Um, you know, but, uh, yeah, so those are the main pointers I can give you for that. Um, like I said, it's Mesa, uh, Arizona, Coda net guns. Um, they work very well, but they are expensive. Um, but I've had mine. I was so lucky because my Coda net gun that it was donated to me. Uh, the first wildlife hospital that I worked at, I started in 2004. Um, I worked there for a few years and, you know, I had a reputation for being uh, a really good wildlife rescuer there. And I, any animal they asked me to go get, I always got it and brought it back. And um, they purchased a net gun for the organization and uh, I started using that and got pretty good with it. Well, unfortunately, the organization, after 25 years, the, the owner, um, the founder, he uh, passed away and a board took over and they kind of ran it into the ground. And so they were kind of selling everything off before we closed and the volunteers there were so kind and they um, they purchased the net gun from the rescue and they, they gave it to me, um, donated it to me to use because they knew, knew that I would still continue to rescue animals. And I did, I've used it now for 18 years or maybe 17, 16 years. And uh, I've caught hundreds of birds with it, saved their lives. Um, you know, these birds would have would have died without having that tool so i thank the people that donated that to me and uh and i hope that uh, they know that it was put to good use um and uh, still to this day i use it i just caught a great blue heron a couple weeks ago with it uh i don't get as many calls now um you know as my own rescue i'm still building up kind of a reputation trying to you know because i'm not as involved with a larger rescue now as closely so i don't get as many calls but um uh, I still get calls to use it, and I shot a great blue heron that had some fabric stuck on its beak um, for several days. I was able to capture it and remove it and release it back to the wild. So I'm still using it to this day. It's a bit more rough looking than it used to be, but um, and I've had to order new nets a couple times, but it still works. It's a, a very effective tool once you get to understand how to use it properly. Um, it's it's one of the best you know, tools I have in my arsenal uh, for rescuing wildlife. And I've even used it on deer and other animals. Um, remember that it is loud though. So if you're in a neighborhood, um, I've even called sometimes police ahead of times in areas where I know it's gonna be a problem and let them know I have a net launching device. It sounds loud. So if you get a report of a gunshot in the, this area, that's what it is. Um, we used to call it the uh, the baby screamer because every time I shot it in a neighborhood, you'd start hearing babies cry and, you know, um, and people would often come out of their houses wondering what's going on, you know? So um, it's definitely a loud tool. And a lot of times you only get one chance that day. So if you have a, a sandhill crane and you shoot and you miss, the, the bird's gonna be so freaked out that you fired this loud thing at it that it flies off and you probably won't see it until the next day. Um, but I've, I've gotten lucky a few times and been able to go track down the bird again and sneak up on it and, and uh, get a second shot and, and capture it in the same day. Um, you know, I love sandhill cranes, but they're probably one of my most frustrating calls that I get because they, you know, uh, they often do get away from me and I have to come back multiple times to capture them. So um, I love them, but it's definitely a really frustrating rescue call to get. And me not being paid to rescue animals, you know, uh, it takes up a lot of my free time, my gas money, all that to keep going out and trying over and over again. And many times these calls are an hour away from where I live or from where I work. And so it uh, it's very time consuming. And then on top of that, you gotta take the bird to the wildlife hospital if it's injured. And that's, you know, it takes hours and hours and sometimes days to capture some of these animals. Uh, so it's a lot of work, but um, 
So anyways, uh, that's my first video. I plan to do more of these to talk in depth about uh, how to rescue specific animals, uh, the most effective ways to do it. And uh, if you have any other ideas that I haven't thought of, uh, I'm totally open to hearing them, open to new ideas of ways to help uh, help me rescue more animals. Uh, if you have comments about uh, what I do or questions about what I do, um, uh, feel free to leave a comment, uh, ask me questions. Um, you know, I love to uh, hear your thoughts on on the video and um, on rescuing wildlife. And uh, I will be doing more of these videos. I'll try to get to birds mammals, reptiles, and maybe even bring in some props to use to kind of show how to properly restrain and capture some of these animals. Um, but I, I thought these might be helpful for people that are looking to get into this type of work um, uh, because there's really not a whole lot of uh, training. It's a lot of it's on the job training and this might save you some time. You learn quick. Also, one other thing that will help you a lot or a couple other things that will help you a lot. Uh, one, always ask the caller when the last time they actually saw the animal was because a lot of the times these people call and they'll say oh you know come help me I have an injured bird but you get there and they haven't seen it since two days ago um, so it sounds urgent but then you find out they haven't seen the bird for two days and you know you don't have all day to be running around looking for a bird they haven't seen so tell them to call you back when they actually see it again because that's usually going to save you a lot of time if they aren't seeing it right now or tell them to go look for it and if they find it call you and you'll come out it'll save you a lot of time the other thing is tell people to stop feeding the animal if they feed a bird every day and you're trying to catch it and its belly's full uh, you have no way to bait it because it's not going to be hungry so i know some of these people really want to feed them and they feel bad for them because they're injured but feeding them it actually puts you at a disadvantage for rescuing them so tell the people to please do not feed the bird while you're trying to capture it because uh, you need to bait them and you need them really hungry uh, to get into your trap or into you know your line of sight to fire the net gun at them whatever so those are all some tips um thanks for watching um, I appreciate uh, any uh, feedback. Uh, follow me if you like. Uh, like the video. Appreciate everything. Look forward to more videos in the near future. Thanks, everyone.